my next guest joining us was somewhat instrumental in helping us get some of the unique plants here at our studio gardens this year. And I'd like for you to meet Mr. Greg Grant. Hi, Greg. Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. Good morning. Greg is the Director of Education and Product Development for Lone Star Growers, a wholesale nursery that's out of San Antonio, Texas. So we've got Greg here in town. And Greg, you can tell, is doing some unique things to some cactus here. Greg, what do you call this, first of all? <laughs> it depends whether you like your plants carved on or not. I like to think of it as botanical sculpture. In other words, making uh, yard art or garden art uh, out of your plants. Some people tend to look at it as horticultural graffiti that you're, that you're marring the plant. But where I come from in Texas, prickly pear grows all over the, the countryside, and people try to get rid of it. So it's not something that happens <laughs> to be a precious item. So if we want to carve on it, it's not that not that big an issue. Now what are you doing? Tell us how you're doing it. Okay, in this case you have a, a fleshy pads on a, on a prickly pear, in this case a spineless prickly pear, and you carve it into shapes or you can cut holes and it can be faces, it can be shapes, it can be stars, squares, triangles, and then the plant will actually heal over and suberize so it, it doesn't hurt the plant. It grows over, if you go through a, a pasture where the cows have eaten on it, it'll do the exact same thing. In this case we carve it in a, in a face or a picture that we want, mm -hmm. it heals back over and then you have a, a semi-permanent piece of art. Now it will start to grow out of that so before long this guy will have ears on his head and you can either carve those pads or let it go and All eventually right. in time these pads will uh, basically disappear and you'd never know you carved on it unless you keep carving on it. Right. Now you brought a slide with you that we're showing the viewers. What? Tell us about what they're seeing in the slide. <laughs> you can really get carried away and do anything that, that you want. I generally like to make faces. Uh, I'll often get carried away and throw in some shapes and stars and, and hearts and that sort of thing but what's fun is to make faces and have each pad be a different face. So uh, uh, there at my home in San Antonio, I, I have a favorite container, this uh, spineless prickly pear that I like to carve on. You put faces, and then I can also take things like echeverias or ghost plant, and you can put tongues in them with, mm -hmm. with sedums or other succulent plants and have a tongue hanging out there and, and, and do anything that you want. And you can put flowers around it as well. Now you're calling this a spineless prickly pear. What, where does this come from? And is it full sun, I assume, just like most cacti? Right. A lot of people are familiar with, uh, with cactus. Well, most cactus that people think of are a plant called prickly pear because it makes an edible fruit somewhat like a pear. If you go to South Texas and Mexico, people talk about pear or tuna, the fruit of a, of a prickly pear cactus. Uh, turns purple and red, somewhat edible, and you can cook and use it as almost a dessert fruit. But in the wild, they have vicious spines all over the mm -hmm. plant. So in this case, it's much easier to take one that's been selected for, for no spines, although you have to be real careful, you know somewhere in a glove, even when you touch the spineless forms, and this is the form with the least amount of spines, it has tiny little little right. bitty spines called glochids that'll get in your hand. What's the genus species of this one? All right. prickly pears belong to the genus Opuntia. In this case, it's a complex hybrid that Luther Burbank did between a number of different species. Okay. So you can pretty much call all spineless prickly pears the genus Opuntia. Okay. Well, you know, we refer to a lot of plants on the show as varieties and cultivars. You mentioned genus species. Why don't we use your expertise, Greg, and go over to some red buds and try to explain that theory a little bit more. So why don't we head on over that way? Sure. Well, what you're seeing is the Oklahoma red bud, and of course, red bud is our state tree. And Greg and I have found out that really red bud is a great example, hopefully, to talk to you about genus species cultivar variety and it sounds very confusing. Now you actually have the true native one, Greg. Tell us a little bit more about that one. All right, this is Ceresus canadensis, variety canadensis, our native red bud, runs all the way from Texas to Canada, all the way to the East Coast. It belongs to the variety canadensis because it has the dull leaf surface. It's a, a good example of a native tree that happens to be cultivated widely in the nursery trade. Now, as I understand it, the way that these other varieties or cultivars have come around is just started as seedlings, right? Exactly. That's one way cultivars can get started. In this case, this is forest pansy. It's a purple leaf selection of the native eastern red bud. So it's Cercis canadensis, variety canadensis, but a seedling popped up in a nursery that had purple leaves. So it was given the cultivar status, which you see in single quotes, of forest pansy, the, the purple leafed red bud. And that means the only way that you can get forest pansy is to propagate it, right? right. This is propagated strictly from, from buds or grafting, so it has to be vegetatively propagated to make it a cultivar. A variety 
is something that seeds naturally in the wild and maintains that status. And a good example of variety would be the Oklahoma red bud. In this case, in the wild, from Oklahoma down through Texas into Mexico, you have a shiny leaf form. It's the variety Texensis. In this case, it happens to be a cultivar selected in Oklahoma that had real pretty flowers and really thick shiny leaves, and it was given the cultivar status of the Oklahoma red bud, or the cultivar Oklahoma. Now, Greg, again, that was fast, and sometimes that's confusing to us. So what we're seeing here is cultivars, but if they see it in a book or on a tag, how would you see that written out? Usually explain to us a little bit about its genus, first species, and... The correct way that it's written out is that the genus, the first word, every plant on Earth has a two-name, uh, a two-word name. The first word is capitalized, the genus. The second word, the species, in this case canadensis, it's lowercase letters, and both of those are either underlined or italicized. The variety name is written in lowercase letter and underlined and italicized. And what's most important for us is the cultivar name is written in capital letters in single quotes, and that's where we get the Oklahoma red bud and the forest pansy. And I know you're a bottom line guy, and the bottom line to this is if you don't know those things and you can't go to the garden centers and ask for it correctly, you may not get what exactly. You're you for. have to go and find Oklahoma on the tag or forest pansy on the tag to ensure that you're going to get a shiny leaf or a purple right. leaf, or you might just end up with a wild red bud with dull leaves and, right. and, and inconspicuous flowers. And sometimes flowers. more pest problems. In exactly. That if you notice, the Oklahoma red bud or the variety Texensis actually has shinier, more pest resistant mm -hmm. foliage than the native version where the gets a leaf spot and some right. bugs and the wind has tattered the foliage. Now Greg, one of the things that I find most interesting though is that these new cultivars started up by just again as seedlings. Now let's go take a look at coleus because there's a w another way cultivars start and that's by sports and I think you've got some good examples to show exactly. us there. Let's go take a look. Well, on the south side of our studio barn around our deck area, we're trying to grow coleus this year in full sun. And we've also planted some over here to the west side of our lattice on the decking side. And Greg, it's really giving us a brilliant display of color, but we broke one off over here and we talked about sports. At, tell us what we've got here. What's happening with this coleus? In this case, another way to get cultivar is to have a genetic mutation grow off an existing plant. Which is also called a sport. Right, a sport would simply be this genetic mutation. It's a plant that looks different. It's not a seedling. It actually grows off the parent plant. In this case, you can take that piece off, propagate that from cuttings, and invent a mm -hmm. new cultivar. All right, now the original plant is this one here, right? Right, it started off as a cultivar called Green Dragon, and then it sported several different other cultivars. This is Lemon Lace, and here we have Plum Parfait sporting off right. the same plant. Now you just didn't know that that was Lemon Yellow or Plum Parfait. You went through a process of trying it, and then you eventually name it, exactly. right? Exactly, that's, that's how it works. And, and you take the cuttings, you put them in the ground, again, and you, you actually named this one, right? I did. It's not a very popular one, but uh, you can have sports all the time. Some of them okay. turn to be good garden plants right. and some of them aren't. In this case, you have to propagate it, see if it remains true or if it right. constantly reverts back. Okay. Now, again, you can't get these from seed, right? No, it's strictly you can't get them from, okay. from seed. Strictly vegetative. So this one did so well. It got its name, and now it's being sold all over Texas and Oklahoma, and we've got it growing here. Now, tell us about the cultivar again and why it's so good. This is the cultivar Plum Parfait, and in extension trials throughout Texas, it turned out to be one of the two most sun-tolerant coleus. Coleus historically has been grown in shade, wouldn't tolerate full sun. In this case, it was one that would tolerate full sun conditions. Right. Now, is, is it characteristic, is this very unique, the, the uh, foliage and everything? The shape of the foliage is unique, and then the multi-colored foliage mm -hmm. is also unique. Now, probably viewers are going to want to know what this is. This isn't really a sun coleus per se. This one is referred to as trailing duck foot coleus, although it does well in the sun. It does well in the sun too. It has a, a foot like a, I mean a leaf like a duck's foot right. where it's got that name. Not quite as showy, but a, a mm -hmm. unique plant. And we grew this one last year, Greg, and people would refer to it as mum coleus. It, it does have foliage right. somewhat like a chrysanthemum. Go ahead and lay that down. This is another one of the, now you're referring to the series as what, Super Sun? Super Sun Coleus. Okay, what's this one here? There are other coleus that have been touted as Sun Coleus, and these were coleus that took full sun in conditions where coleus normally wouldn't ever grow. Right. This is Burgundy Sun, probably the most sun tolerant coleus that I've ever tested, and we tested some 125 different cultivars to come up with these two. It has bright maroon foliage. It occurred as a sport as well and tolerates full sun conditions. Right, and we're actually seeing a sport of that one over there as well. Exactly, it's a, you can see the plant that it came from. Right. Now, Greg, the other thing that is so impressive to these 
about these for us is that it doesn't send up a lot of flower stalks or spikes like some of the others. Why is that? Historically, coleus has been grown from seed. One, it burned in the sun, and two, it went to seed during the summertime, and you don't grow coleus for the flowers, you grow it strictly for the foliage, right. and you had to go through and pick the flowers off. So in this case, we had a new version of an old-timey plant that right. was actually better than, than the old version. And, and that old-timey plant we have growing in the rainbow garden, and it's called the rainbow series, and it's very obvious. We have it in partial shade. Right, where coleus is right. supposed to be grown. And it's sending up flower spikes all the time. It's a nonstop battle trying to prune them. What about some of the old heirloom type coleuses like that? And are, are they still very popular? In that case, in coleus, it's not as popular. In right. a number of other plants, the old fashioned versions are becoming right. more popular than the new version because they're tougher and easier to grow. Right. And uh, what the folks probably don't know as well is that Greg is also a co-author of a book on that particular topic. Greg, get over here and show us your book here and who you're have written that with. Uh, a friend of mine, Dr. William C. Welch, and I wrote a book on southern heirloom plants because we began to notice that a lot of the older cultivars and the older varieties and species of plants were tougher and more adapted uh, to garden conditions in the new version. Right. So this is obviously available at bookstores across our area. And Greg, listen, we appreciate you helping educate us on cultivar variety and especially for your nursery donating a lot of the plants that the viewers and visitors to the gardens are enjoying this year. Thanks a lot. You're welcome.